Hello, everyone. Good morning, and thanks for your patience uh, as we got everything started today. All right. On behalf of the USAID Bureau for Food Security and the AgriLinks platform, I'd like to welcome you to today's special webinar on draft guidance for USAID-funded nutrition-sensitive programming. My name is Julie McCarty, and I'm a management specialist with the USAID Bureau for Food Security, and I'll be facilitating today and moderating the question and answer portion of the event. Uh, a portion of this webinar will be spent specifically discussing a draft guidance brief on nutrition-sensitive agriculture. And if you'd like to download this brief, just to make sure that you have it in front of you, it is available in the file downloads box, which is on the left side of your screen. It's the, the second item in there that says, or the first item that says nutrition sensitive agriculture draft. You can also download the full USAID nutrition strategy uh, in that file downloads box. And we also have a few links in our links box to a variety of nutrition sensitive agriculture resources. Before we get started, I just wanted to very quickly mention that AgriLinks has an Ag Sector Council uh, seminar webinar coming up this Wednesday, uh, both in person here in Washington, D.C., or you can join via webinar. And its title is Integrating Landscape Management into Climate Smart Agriculture. And we will uh, share a link to the registration for that in the chat box. So very quickly, I'm just going to introduce our speakers here today and then go ahead and pass it over to them uh, to take it over. And first up will be Richard Green, who is Senior Deputy Assistant to the Administrator with the USAID Bureau for Food Security. And Richard has served on projects in more than 20 countries during 30 years with USAID and 35 years in the global health development field. And I think his name uh, is familiar to many of you. We'll also have uh, Sally Abbott speaking. And she is a nutrition advisor with the USA Bureau for Food Security and has been a part of the team that's developed the uh, USA nutrition strategy. And we were hoping to have Jeannie Harvey, a gender advisor uh, with the Bureau for Food Security, join us today remotely. We may or may not be able to bring her in, uh, but if we're not able to, we'll have uh, another member of our team, Diane DiBernardo, a nutrition advisor, uh, give a presentation uh, on the Indonesian project. All right, so we are ready to dive right in into the meat of the content of our presentation. Uh, we encourage you along the way to enter your questions and comments in the chat box at any time, but we'll be pausing at certain portions uh, in the middle and at the end of the webinar today to answer your questions. And I'm going to go ahead and pass the microphone over to Richard. Uh, good morning. Good morning, everybody, and thanks for joining us. And uh, it says in our USAID multi-sectoral nutrition strategy that agriculture may be able to address and prevent undernutrition. May, but not necessarily. And so what we want to do is provide some guidance on nutrition-sensitive agriculture, but more important, distill this down into four key actions that we would like to track uh, and, and basically um, make sure that in our programs we're able to address all four so that we can classify them as nutrition sensitive agriculture. So the idea is uh, can we have a filter like this where we have a small number of key actions uh, where we actually certify a program as nutrition sensitive or not uh, and then uh, that would allow us then to uh, report internationally on how much nutrition agriculture we do as well as to um, evaluate and verify the data to see if this really works. So this is really the idea. We want your feedback specifically on four items which we would make uh, if they, they turn out to be the right ones, uh, the prerequisites for programs uh, that uh, uh, in order to be labeled by us as nutrition sensor. So that is the concept, and we want your feedback both on the concept and on the content of these four items, which we'll get to later, uh, as well as how we would implement such a scheme. Uh, because one thing is clear that at the very beginning of this concept of nutrition sensitive programming, uh, uh, it was very expansive, and in fact, if you uh, 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 paid attention to the Nutrition for Growth commitments, uh, these were very high for the U.S. government, a couple of billion dollars a year. 
And so the problem with that is that it makes us feel like we're spending more nutrition than we really are uh, effectively, and then it kind of includes everything related to nutrition in our um, in our programming. So we want to make this more real, much more discriminating, and we want to actually uh, assess whether some specific actions can make a difference in terms of the effect of agriculture programs um, on nutrition. And so we're going to get to that uh, in a moment. I, I do want to say that we are, are concentrating our efforts at the beginning here on nutri nutrient-rich value chains. And that is going to be the focus of our discussion on nutrition-sensitive agriculture, beginning with those programs that promote nutrient-rich value chains. Later on, we'll talk more about other uh, agricultural programs that may not fall in this category, that, but that are certainly important to do related to cereals, et cetera. Um, so uh, to get started, before we get into that specific discussions and those four points and the indicators that relate to them, I'm going to ask Sally Abbott to give some general background on the USAID uh, uh, multi-sectoral nutrition strategy uh, and how this particular exercise fits into to our broader plan. Great. Um, thank you, Richard. Can uh, people hear me okay? Great. So I just wanted to start with um, the aim of the strategy. And as Richard mentioned, we released the um, multisectoral nutrition strategy earlier this year. And all the programs that are working in nutrition across the agency really in coordination and um, with, in collaboration to support our overall aim, which is to guide the agency's policies and programs for nutrition in both. Sally, I'm just going to ask you to just slow down. Kind of, yeah, yeah, slow down <laughs> and also um, move the uh, headpiece a little closer to your mouth, I guess. Okay, is it's that better? Yeah. yeah, it is a little bit better. Okay. Sorry about that, and I will try to slow down um, a little bit, and I will ask for uh, those in the room to remind me if I'm speaking too quickly again. So as I was saying, the aim of the strategy is to guide the agency's policy and programs for nutrition in both emergency and development contexts with the goal of improving nutrition to save lives, build resilience, and increase economic productivity and advanced development. Uh, what I've included is another slide is our overall conceptual framework. I'm not sure if the visual on this is very well, but I do encourage everybody to go to the nutrition strategy, which we've included, um, uh, I believe, as an attachment to this presentation. It's also available on the USAID's homepage. And one of the reasons for showing this is sort of showing where um, nutrition sensitive agriculture fits into our overall goal of improving optimal nutrition. This is an um, has been adapted from the UNICEF framework and is looking at how we go to improved nutrition. And um, really on agriculture, we're looking about at the availability of sufficient, safe, and nutritious foods, access to sufficient, safe, and nutrition foods, and stability and resilience. I think that also addresses, agriculture can also address around adequate time, care, uh, space, and support for care. And that's something that um, we're talking about such a uh, a high number of women that are working in agriculture that is important to look at. Um, when we're talking about why nutrition is sensitive agriculture, I'm not sure if Richard mentioned this, but the Lancet series in 2013 mentioned that with 90% coverage of the nutrition specific interventions, interventions that have evidence around them, we know that we can reduce stunting by 20%. And we know that that isn't enough. We know that if we want to uh, reach our goals of reducing stunting and feed the future, but also worldwide, we're looking at the Global Health Assembly goal of reducing stunting by 40% by 2025, that we need to do more than just nutrition-specific adventures. We know that agriculture is essential for improving nutrition. We know that um, something like 70% of the world poor in feed the future countries work in agriculture. And we know that without changes in specifically a trying to address nutrition, we won't see the changes that we think that we can um, in nutritional status. We've done a number of things on looking at how we can address um, 
nutrition in agriculture. And this is a set of programming principles that I think was originally developed by Anthony and our spring project looked with us on, um, and I've adapted them just slightly here. And we're looking at making sure we incorporate explicit objectives and indicators in the design process. Looking at incorporating nutrition promotion and education. Looking at diverse, diversifying production and increasing nutrient-dense crops and livestock when it makes economic sense to do so. We're looking at improving the quality of processing, storage, and preservation of food. We're looking at expanding market access to vulnerable groups and expanding markets for nutritious foods. During project design, we want to make sure we're assessing the local context and addressing underlying causes specific to the situation. Um, a really, really big part of it is ensuring that design works to empower women and promotes gender equity. And that we are targeting the nutritionally vulnerable to improve this equity. We want, and finally, we want to work across all sectors, collaborating and coordinating whenever possible and maintaining and improving the agricultural nutrition resource base. So these are a set of sort of programming principles that all um, nutrition or agriculture programs should look to address, whether they are designed to nutrition sensitive programs specifically or not. These are programming principles that as they take them into account can help to um, make their programs more nutrition sensitive. And when I say more nutrition sensitive, I'm really looking at these pathways that were, again, were originally developed by IFPRI in the spring project worked on for us. Um, agricultural livelihoods affect nutrition of individual household members through multiple pathways and interactions. This framework depicts in the figure how various agricultural investments or activities could improve access to food and health care, how they impact and are affected by the enabling environment, and how they ultimately affect nutrition of women and children. The pathways aren't always linear. There are many interactions among them. In general, they can be divided into three main routes at the household level. Food production, which can directly affect the food available for household consumption, as well as the price of diverse foods. Agriculture income for household expenditure. And women's empowerment, which affects income, caring, and capacity practices, and female energy expenditure. Acting on all of these routes is, enabling, is the enabling environment for nutrition, which includes several key components the natural resource environment, the food market environment, the health, water, and sanitation environment, the nutrition, health, knowledge, and norms, and other factors such as policy and governance. Um, sorry about that. So acting on all these routes is the enabling environment, the food market environment, the health and water and, and sanitation environment, nutrition, health, knowledge, and norms, and other factors such as policy and government. These components may affect nutrition of consumers or communities, not only farmer households. Child nutrition outcomes ultimately feed back into the national economic growth and household assets and livelihoods, including those that contribute to both agriculture and non-agriculture sources of income. Now, one of the things I want to stress in this is that when we're looking at the child nutrition outcomes, in some ways it sort of looks at the the conceptual framework we had in the previous slide turned on its side with the outcomes at the, at the end. And one of the things that we found is that a lot of our projects are sort of working on one end, our, our, our agriculture projects, and our nutrition-specific projects may be working on the other. But there are a lot of pieces in the middle, looking at processing and storage, looking at access, looking at how um, agriculture income can be affecting health care, and looking at how women's empowerment can affect caring capacities, which then can affect nutritional status of mother and children, and that those missing pieces often aren't there, that we have projects working at the separate end. And one of the things we're trying to do across our portfolio is drive them together. So not expecting that agriculture products work all the way across the, the pathway, but that, that our projects are working in coordination so that the pathways are addressed in their entirety. Um, however, we do think that there are a few projects and a few areas that can have almost low-hanging fruit and that can be affected more uh, quickly. When we looked at, um, when USAID looked at what projects were doing two years ago now, we had a spring project go through and do a, um, a landscape analysis. One of the things that was found was that a lot of times um, specific value chains were picked because they were thought to be nutritionally rich. And so when we look at nutrient-rich value chains, um, what our M&E team did is actually went out and defined what we meant by a nutrient-rich value chain. 
And on the Feed the Future website under progress, there is the Feed the Future Indicator Handbook. And this has the definition of the three new indicators that Rachel was going to discuss further. But when we've defined a nutrient-rich value chain, we've defined these as a commodity is defined as nutrient-rich as it meets any of the following criteria. It's biofortified. It's a legume, nut, or some seeds, such as sesame seeds, sunflower seeds, pumpkin seeds, wheat germ, or sprouted legume seeds. It's an animal source food. This includes dairy products, fish, eggs, organ meats, meat, flesh foods, and other miscellaneous small animal protein. Um, a dark yellow or orange flesh root or tuber, or is a fruit or vegetable that meets certain criteria of threshold for being a high source of micronutrients on a 100 per calorie, 100 calorie and 100 gram basis. And the full definition of what that is is in the Feed the Future Indicator Handbook. And now I'm going to pass it back to Richard to talk about our um, critical points to define nutrition sensitive agriculture and what we're really going to be focusing on on our projects that are looking at these nutrient rich value chains. Thanks. For And we do want some feedback, whether we're on the right track, is trying to establish a small number, in this case, four specific actions which would define for us whether a agriculture program focused on nutri foods can be classified as nutrition sensitive. Because eventually, we want to be able to report on our nutrition sensitive agriculture and Frankly, uh, 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 we want to be more discriminating than we had to be in the past when we didn't have uh, any real criteria on this. And also, we want to make it real. We just don't want to say that any horticulture program is automatically nutrition sensitive um, or any uh, program addressing women. We want to be able to uh, have value added and be able to really use these programs to improve nutrition and be able to measure it, and at the same time, be able to report more accurately on how much of our agriculture programs are really nutrition sensitive and work in the future to be able to increase that number. Um, and again, as Sally said, this is pretty important because even if you able to scale up to 90% coverage, the 10 most important evidence-based nutrition interventions, it will only reduce stunting by 20%. So we really do need a lot of nutrition-sensitive programming, beginning in agriculture, but this program needs to be real. So let me go through um, our proposed four critical points, and this is what we want the discussion on, uh, and then talk a little bit about some of the new indicators that we have that relate to this. And again, we're focusing only on what we call the nutrient-rich value chain. So we're not talking about all of the uh, um, important programs related to cereals and others at this time. So what are we talking about nutrition, nutri nutrient-rich value chains? You begin with horticulture, aquaculture, uh, livestock, legumes, these are the types of programs that we're going to um, begin with. Um, the, uh, and so here are the four critical points which I will go over. One, we do want to target production of nutri uh, nutrient-rich crops, ideally those that include nutrients lacking in diet. Um, in horticulture programs, which is probably the biggest thing we do in uh, on the more, uh, um, in Feed the Future, one of the biggest things, uh, there is a whole host of different vegetables that could be um, um, promoted uh, and marketed, and the choice of them is very, very important. For instance, when I was in Bangladesh, uh, eggplant was a very, very important vegetable, but there are a lot of gourds uh, which uh, could be, uh, um, you could make money on, but weren't particularly um, uh, um, nutri nutrient rich. So the first thing is target production of nutrient rich crops and ideally that includes those nutrients lacking the diet. Second, include behavior change communication component specifically aimed at consumption of target crops. Now all of these programs that I mentioned, horticulture, 
legumes, uh, agriculture, livestock, uh, women play a major role. There is always outreach, whether it's ag extension or others, to these women involved in these programs. There needs to be a uh, um, uh, evidence-based behavior change communication uh, component uh, so that when women are reached in terms of horticulture um, or any of these programs, they also include some key nutrition messages that are both related to um, things such as consumption of the nutrient-rich foods, but also some of the key messages related to nutrition for the local area. It could be exclusive breastfeeding. It could be hand washing with soap. It could be dietary diversity. It could be um, uh, micronutrient uh, consumption, etc. So there, uh, there has to be a connection. Any nutrient, uh, a nutrition sensitive agriculture program like this has to have some connection and knowledge of the nutrient, uh, nutrition specific interventions supported by uh, the health sector principally. So um, first one was target production of nutrient rich crops. Second is include a behavior change uh, communication component. And we can help every program develop one because we have programs in each of our countries that relate to uh, health and nutrition. And we have strong links with the health sector, as I know many of our implementers do. Third, ensure the target crop uh, is available in local markets and support consumption education. A lot of our hort programs, horticulture or legume, uh, uh, livestock or agriculture programs are focused on marketing, income generation um, uh, as, uh, as a value chain. And we want to make sure that the nutrient-rich uh, products under these programs are marketed, are available in local markets, and that we track the consumption uh, of these products. And we promote uh, the consumption of these products in our marketed areas. Um, the last one is very important, which is measuring outcomes, particularly beginning with consumption. We want to measure the consumption of these nutrient-rich foods that we promote. Because this has been the rub with horticulture programs. If you and vegetable garden programs that we have promoted over the years, all the Cochrane analyses uh, and others that I'm aware of uh, provide very limited data that these programs improve nutrition because there isn't consumption of these nutrient-rich foods. So we need to measure consumption. Now, again, in Bangladesh, a, uh, 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 we had a horticulture program where they did measure consumption. And the good news was that there was significant improvements in consumption. The bad news is you know, doubling of zero is still zero. There was very low, but it's a start. So measuring consumption, tracking consumption among the producers. Of, of particularly women and children, and among the targeted, marketed areas of our nutrient-rich foods. So these are the four major critical points that we would ask that all these programs um, uh, implement to be classified as nutrition-sensitive agriculture. Uh, and related to this, uh, we have some new indicators that our M&E people uh, developed three indicators uh, uh, in particular. Uh, and it's on your slide. Um, number one, uh, the uh, total quantity of targeted nutrient-rich value chain commodities set aside for home consumption by direct beneficiary producer households. Two, the prevalence of women of reproductive age who consume targeted nutri nutrient-rich value chain commodities, the ones we're promoting in our program. And three, the prevalence of children, 6 to 23 months, who consume targeted nutrient-rich value chain commodities. So there we have it. We've got four uh, 
litmus criteria for constituting being classified as nutrition sensitive agriculture program. And we would ask, assuming these are the right, uh, this approach is a good one, that's what we're asking your feedback on, we would ask all of our programs to include these actions. They'd be in the work plans that we would have. Uh, we would include them in our, uh, our valuations. Uh, we would ask that your annual or semi-annual reports include uh, reference to these four actions. Uh, and we would use this as a way of reporting back on our nutrition for growth commitments on nutrition, uh, how much we're spending on nutrition sensitive programming, at least in the ag sector. So we want uh, your feedback on all of this. Is this a harebrained idea to, to, uh, to boil this down to four key? Because you know the problem is, uh, uh, and there is no lack of guidance. In fact, I started collecting them when I was at the uh, ICN2 conference. Uh, how many different sets of guidance there are on nutrition sensitive programming, including nutrition sensitive agriculture. And because there's so much out there, some of it vague, some of it very specific, that it is easy simply to, you know, to, uh, to uh, uh, massage our messaging and basically say that, well, yes, we're, we're doing many aspects of it we understand. We want to boil it down to either you're, you're in or you're out on these four key messages. So is this concept a reasonable one? Are these the right four critical points? Uh, if they are, uh, then do we have the right way to follow this up in work plans and annual reports, et cetera? And that's it in a nutshell. So we're very anxious to hear people's uh, feelings about this and their input. And so now we're going to open it up to um, our comments. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Vincali, for your excellent presentation and thorough coverage of these issues. We've had a lot of great questions and comments in the chat box. Uh, please keep them coming. We will be saving all of the comments in this chat box and using them as input for adjusting this nutrition-sensitive agriculture guidance. We'll also be formulating a survey, which we plan to send out to all of you, to anyone who registered for this event, uh, to help further commentary. Um, that will be something that you can, uh, if you'd like to spend a bit more time reading the brief uh, and, and formulating some questions and comments, that would be fantastic. So I wanted to uh, quickly bring up a comment that was uh, brought up by Britta Hansen and seconded by Christy Cook, a comment for Richard, uh, which is that agriculture and horticulture programs need good information on what the nutrient gaps are in countries so that they can focus on the needed crops that can potentially fill those key gaps. Uh, they're just emphasizing that there's a huge gap in understanding of these nutrient deficiencies and uh, particularly which target groups uh, have a, the largest deficit. And we're just wondering if you had comments on that. Sure. I think um, maybe I will address that. I think that's absolutely true that a lot of cases we don't know what specific nutrients are, which you are missing in the diet. I think if there are some basic nutrients that we know, um, are often missing, vitamin A, iron, zinc, um, and Q, but I think that uh, doing the context of that, yes, that has no impact in getting these projects and actually doing some sort of analysis to see what is consumed and what isn't consumed is something that can greatly aid in time. That's why we say actually we want to address those that are lacking in the diet. If you don't know what's lacking in diet, to address them with the basic nutrients. Uh, yes, ideally we would, would hope that there is some analysis on what is lacking in the diet before um, we decide what crops to target. And I, I would point out that we are working under the spring project on a region um, uh, of um, tool that will help uh, identify what a good base analysis you could use ahead of time. And that should be launched in the next year. Great, thank you. Um, and Kristen Weeks uh, mentioned that she likes the proposed new indicators, but her concern in looking at feed to future indicators is that too often we go straight to these as the output level and don't think about how this might fit into a house's productive plan for the future. 
she said that I think we need to incorporate these more in baselines and design, but not st jump straight to reports and work plans. So I think on the indicators, that this is a start. We um, didn't have anything on indicators a year ago, and we are again working with spring on developing guidance for monitoring nutrition services programs at the output out, um, at an outcome level, and that's going to be almost a year away. That that's something that um, we don't have. We haven't done, um, so we don't have the guidance on doing. But I would point out that if our missions are interested in having help on this, we have resources available. And um, we are interested in doing a better job at coming up with output outcome um, level indicators uh, to monitor. Yeah, you might want to jump in, Julie, because um, we basically reached our user limit on the meeting oh. and I had to check um, in, and so we're just trying to get him back in. Yeah. All right, all right. Um, Sorry about that. We had 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 that. Which is a uh, which is all right. We're going to bring him back in, and Sally's been doing a great job answering questions in the meantime. And we have a lot of questions and comments coming in through the chat box. Probably won't be able to address, or definitely won't be able to address all of them today. But we are capturing each of them. They're very useful questions and pieces of input to help us uh, further edit and uh, provide useful nutrition sensitive guidance. That's okay. I'll be paying attention. Thank you. And I also just wanted to point out that Anne Swindale is um, in the chat box, and she is one of the key members of our M&A team that helped develop some of this guidance. And she had a suggestion on including reference requirement that CCC includes messages aimed at overall dietary diversity, including additional content we see on targeted and nutrient rich value chains. And I think that's a great point to make. Uh, there have been a couple of comments in your Sally about animal stored foods and also fisheries. Uh, for instance, Robert Best uh, particularly mentioned that uh, you know, fish are one of the world's most widely traded food products and among the most nutritious. And so I think there's a bit of a concern about a focus on crops and how, um, how animal stored foods, especially fish, might fit into this. Uh, I think that fish are absolutely uh, an animal source food are discussing and talking about including what else other than yes, include fish in that. It might be some emphasis on that first critical point, the target production of nutrient rich crops. Can we include fish in that? Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And Richard Richard's back on. Yeah. yeah. Thank um, you. Um, certainly um, fish is uh, agriculture is one of the four that we talk about uh, as uh, our initial starting point for this discussion. Horticulture, uh, agriculture, livestock, and legumes. And we, we would actually like to see broader, um, more expanded agriculture programs because of, uh, uh, of the, um, the importance of the availability of protein and the, um, and the nutrients. All right. Um, we also had a, a bit of a specific question, but asking whether the use of micronutrient enriched fertilizers like zinc enriched would be considered as a piece of nutrition in agriculture. I think that where there are nutrients um, missing in the soil, it's something that should be addressed. Um, I think that one of the things we're trying to get to is to push people, push people a little bit further on nutrition sensitive agriculture and looking at a very clear criteria for a certain subset of agriculture programs and that can get people a little bit further than we've done previously. All right. And Chris, we think I'd like to ask, if there is ongoing in combining nutrition and agriculture prevention, some are co-located, most are focused on food crops. Some have nutrition components combined with the connection. We are two to three years in the use of the baseline, and are there any RTPs or feedback? Thanks for the question. We recognize that uh, most of our programs that we have are uh, anywhere from just beginning this year to uh, two, three, four years old. Uh, and uh, so this is um, a proposal 
uh, to move ahead, and we really want to see if uh, how quickly we can implement uh, these critical points if they prove to be the right ones. Now, uh, this is not going to be the only uh, criteria uh, in the end that we use to, to look at nutrition um, sensitive agriculture, but it's going to be major ones, and so we're interested, gee, are, are these actions um, important ones? Are these actions we should be promoting? Um, are there, um, are, are there um, any of these for which we, um, you know, um, given the, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, when we develop new or continuing ongoing programs, that uh, um, are not that important to, to implement. So that, this is the idea. There will be other programs that won't have the opportunity to do this, but we feel that these are four very critical points that will improve the nutrition um, impact of, our, of these types of agriculture programs. So um, we're very interested in any particular discussion of any of these four points. Um, and I'm not sure if you have any comments on how the Nutrition Innovation Lab might be involved. That was uh, something that came up in the chat box. And, uh, actually, we have Diane DiBernardo here online, uh, who has joined us instead of uh, Jimmy Harvey. And we'll have a, a bit to say later about the Genius Project. Uh, but she has a comment about the Nutrition Innovation Lab. We'll see if we can get her audio. So can everybody, can everybody hear me? Okay. Okay. So our AOR for the Nutrition Innovation Lab is not present, but I'm familiar enough with some of the work that the Nutrition Innovation Lab is doing to maybe answer adequately. Um, basically, the Nutrition Innovation Lab isn't implementing programs so much as researching programs um, operationally and for impact. And for example, in um, Bangladesh, a new associate award was just launched. And it look at the combined impact of integrating and co-locating agriculture and nutrition projects and activities. And that will include behavior change programs as well as others. But it won't actually be carrying out those activities per se. But I think we'll be learning a lot of lessons learned from these um, research activities that we can apply to implementation projects. Since we've had so many comments come through and since we know that we have Diane's audio working, uh, I think this might be a good time to quickly let you know about two projects or have a few more come through. All right. We're getting um, some signals in the room. We have a, a seat. So this is a question that, that sometimes uh, comes up from our, uh, our colleague Richard Tinsley about uh, the caloric needs for smallholder farmers and the concern that um, that we may not be focusing enough on having a sufficient caloric needs for farmers, that it may be up to 4,000 kilocalories a day. Um, and can we meet that basic metabolism? Is, is that an important consideration alongside the micronutrient piece? Well, I mean, uh, well, I mean uh, it's a very good question that uh, under local circumstances, uh, there may be other um, actions which will promote better nutrition. Now, our focus is really on um, undernutrition for um, women of reproductive age and children, and particularly for our goal level of stunting. And so these four critical points are aimed at that, with the idea that every project uh, among horticulture, aquaculture, livestock, and legumes are in a different phase of development. and uh, and they're going to have to take a look at um, on how they would implement these and what others. Now, in terms of the overall, uh, you know, kilocalorie consumption, that's an important item, and I'm not sure the, um, uh, um, you know, within the range of our programs, what actions that they would take. But uh, it is an important one, and um, you know, we're not we're not trying to cover the entire waterfront. These are four basic actions 
that would be a base of which, based on the local circumstances, which is one of our programming pr principles, we would add um, obviously a whole slew of other things in there. But these are things we would want to make sure that these programs supported uh, because um, uh, we, we feel they're um, you know, uh, there's evidence base for behavior change communication. Uh, there's certainly an evidence base for including nutri nutrient rich uh, uh, crops and varieties, and we do want to uh, uh, measure our outcomes. Thanks. I just want to add um, briefly to that, and I think that Hillary made a really good point that. Uh, we are also looking at a situation where people are consuming too many calories. Mm -hmm. um, her point was that in Peru that the issue, even with women who are agriculture producers, have a uh, high BMI. Look at the trends. That is something that we're seeing an increase of overweight and obesity more than we're seeing um, levels of undernutrition in adults through low BMI. And I think that's something we need to pay attention to. And one of the reasons we really aren't focusing on caloric intake, but we're focusing on a quality diet with um, sufficient dietary diversity and sufficient intake of nutrients that are missing. And I also wanted to point out that um, Hiram LaRue, uh, one of our colleagues at USDA pointed that there is a lot of, that we can learn from our um, USAID SNAP programs in the U.S. And I do want to say that we are working on a U.S. government coordination plan right now looking at how we can continue our efforts across our U.S. government programs and make sure that we're learning from all of our programs. So thank you to my colleague at USDA who brought up that point as well. Yeah, the, uh, the, uh, we, uh, at this point, I'd be very, I'd be very interested in um, asking if there is a implementer involved presently in a horticulture, aquaculture, uh, legume or livestock program that would want to comment on these um, uh, four critical points, uh, either by saying that, well, they seem to be reasonable or already, uh, we think we can do them, or uh, there would be a stretch for various reasons. Um, so if there's somebody out there related to an implementer um, for one of these programs, I'd be very interested in, uh, uh, in hearing their reaction to these four points. Thanks, Richard. And I see some folks typing in the chat box, so there may be some comments coming in uh, regarding those questions. One more piece that I up that might be worth to the uh, spring and ingenious uh, sections was just a little bit of more focus on that second point and uh, having better evaluation of rigor on behavior change messaging. Um, they're a concern that a lot of messaging becomes messaging for messaging sake and doesn't actually lead to behavior change. And a, um, an emphasis that the behavior change intervention should be more robust than just targeted at the consumption of target crops. Um, do you have any comments just about that, BCC? <laughs> yeah, thanks for that comment. Um, the behavior, the behavior change is yeah. not just uh, uh, related to consumption, but that's obviously an important part. It's related, as I mentioned, to the evidence-based nutrition interventions which are appropriate for the locality where you have your programs. And it could be exclusive breastfeeding, could be a major issue. Could be dietary diversity at weaning. It could be the micronutrient status. It could be hand washing in soap, with soap. So it is not strictly consumption, but that's one of them because that has been the rub uh, and the deficiency uh, on many garden projects is the fact that all of the stuff is sold and there isn't much improvement in the nutrition status of food producer families as well. So yes, we completely agree. And certainly behavior change programming has to be quality. And this is why I mentioned the connection between these types of programs and the um, the the more health-related nutrition-specific programming where there is, in general, tested and evidence-based behavior change modules uh, that could be used uh, in some degree, appropriate degree, for the interactions with women 
uh, for horticulture, aquaculture, livestock, or legume programs. But that's a very good comment, and we agree. Nico Jensen did mention, in reaction to your question about the four points and implementers, um, that he has seen that the harvest program in Cambodia and the TABT program in Tanzania have been doing great work in that regard. And so we'll see if a few more comments uh, roll in from other people working with us uh, about their comfort, comfort level with the critical points. Um, would this be an all right time to quickly run your spring in Indonesia? In Okay, so uh, we have uh, an amazing set of questions and comments come in. I'm sorry that we haven't been able to address every one of them, but you've, you've all been so robust in your your questions. And um, let's see. I'm just flipping through to see if I can find one more key question or comment. Oh, so we have had a request for some best practice examples where those can be obtained. Okay. Well, I. I uh, that is a very good comment. We're aware of some programs, like the one I mentioned in, in Bangladesh, that uh, where there, um, number one, there are methodologies to estimate consumption of these uh, um, products. Uh, in that case, it was a horticulture program uh, that are produced. So th uh, that's something we could share with people. Uh, uh, there are also uh, behavior, there's behavior change modules related to nutrition out there. Virtually every country where we work, you wouldn't, uh, and again, you would want to pick and choose uh, out of them, but they're, uh, they're usually ones that are evidence-based and they've been pre-tested. Uh, uh, and certainly we know a lot, I think, in each country about uh, the types of, uh, whether it is uh, um, uh, legumes or uh, horticulture, for instance, uh, what may be the most nutritious crops which fit in with the, uh, with the gaps in the local situation. So we will try to gather together some of the best practices uh, relating to these critical points to share with people. Uh, but uh, uh, on the other hand, we're very interested in uh, having people share with us their tools and their best practices uh, related to these points. Or if they have an additional point that they would want to propose and some best practice related to that. Because, I mean, I haven't heard or seen much that says that this is not a, a reasonable approach to try to boil it down to some critical points that can be tracked and followed up. So um, uh, we're going to carefully review um, all of these responses. And what we're going to do is we're going to go out and uh, uh, follow up with a survey and get some additional and then review those. But um, assuming that this approach, we don't hear anything compelling um, uh, um, to argue against this approach, we will then try to review making sure that uh, we've got the, uh, the four correct critical points. We will also collect some best practices related to these. And, and I'm hoping some of the people on this webinar will, uh, will alert us to those. Uh, and then what we're going to do is um, uh, go back and think about how, again, we implement these. And again, uh, our initial ideas are asking that they be put in work plans for these uh, you know, Feed the Future programs at horticulture, livestock, legumes, and aquaculture, that they be, uh, that uh, um, we share uh, um, some best practices and some um, tools that, uh, that we have, um, help them, for instance, um, uh, uh, access some of the behavior change uh, modules that uh, uh, that may exist for that locality, uh, then we would ask that uh, the implementers of these types of programs report on these indicators in their annual and semi-annual reports. 
and then we'd want to get a sense later on uh, what the impact um, might be uh, on some of these programs. Because I said uh, the data we had seen, we have seen historically on horticulture uh, and gardening program is not very strong for its impact on nutrition. So this is how uh, we would like to proceed uh, at this point. We're going to review your responses. Uh, we're going to send out a survey. We're going to look at best practices. Uh, and then we're going to uh, see if we can progressively uh, implement this, um, um, uh, assuming uh, uh, that we continue to get uh, some uh, positive, uh, you know, very helpful comments, uh, activity by activity within Feed the Future. And then this would lead to our ability to report back on how much nutrition sensitive agriculture that we're really doing, which is going to be a much smaller but more um, a genuine uh, um, a number than before, which was basically every program that that uh, uh, involved uh, any of these products were automatically assigned as nutrition sensitive. So that is the idea, and we really appreciate all of the uh, comments, we're, and they're still coming in. And uh, again, we're going to try to address all of them. Uh, we're going to do a separate survey, and then we're going to continue and work towards, in the next two or three months, uh, trying to implement um, uh, this approach um, and at the same time collect some of the tools and the best practices, uh, whether it's on um, measuring consumption or behavior change modules. And we're going to be very interested in the use of our three new indicators related to this, which were developed by the Feed the Future monitoring and evaluation team. So now, uh, I mean, uh, the next, um, uh, um, just as a closing, we are going to have very brief uh, um, uh, descriptions of several of our programs where uh, our missions, and this, is prim this part is primarily for our missions, can access some technical assistance related to nutrition-sensitive agriculture. Uh, and they're going to be brief, and these are really aimed towards our our mission folks who would be able to benefit uh, if they would if they feel they need it of uh, these uh, four uh, programs. So we're going to turn this over to very brief um, descriptions of these. And again, thanking everybody who have uh, given us comments on our four critical uh, proposed actions, uh, as well as thanking people in advance for responding to our follow-up survey. I just want to mention that there are several uh, central projects that are available. Um, there's the Food and Nutrition Technical Assistance Project 3, um, Global, the GAIN Project, and both Spring and Ingenious. Um, what we're going to talk about today is Spring and is because we in the um, Office of and country strategies and implementation in the technical division have some core resources in these projects that are able to provide assistance to, to our missions. Um, Spring um, is one of the projects that we have uh, buy into, that it's a global health project overall that um, we in the Bureau of Food Security have put some investments in. And I mentioned a couple of things that they've worked on us in the past. Um, they're specifically working on, with USA and with implementing partners, to better design, implement, and monitor Feed the Future activities, providing technical assistance to operationalize these the pathways that I mentioned earlier, building the evidence base on what works better, and to document, share innovation results and lessons learned. And specifically this year, we have put funds into the project to be working both on monitoring and evaluation and operationalizing these pathways. So if there are missions that are looking for assistance on monitoring and evaluation um, and on the operationalizing, then please reach out to me and I will work with the project I'm putting you in touch and I, um, with the best way forward. And I also want to mention that the four indicators that are the three indicators that we mentioned earlier, we are going to be testing. And I don't know that we've identified the sites that we're going to be testing them. So before they become standard indicators, or I guess they're already standard, before they become a little bit more uh, pushed as indicators, 
we are going to be field testing them in a couple of missions. So um, if there is mission staff that is interested in this and we haven't been in touch with you yet that are specifically working on uh, these nutrient-rich value chains, please re reach out to me and I will um, work with you. And I'm going to pass things to Diane, who is very kindly stepping in for Jeannie and has not seen these slides before, but is going to uh, do her best to very, very briefly mention Ingenious, another project we have. So thank, goodness. so thank goodness we had our launch last week, so now I'm well versed in this and can probably wing it without having to have seen the slides. Um, so we launched last week our new associate award to the Modernizing Azure Extension Services, or MAS, um, award with our new Ingenious Award, which stands for Integrating Gender and Nutrition with an Agricult Agriculture Extension Services. Um, the purpose of this award is to help us explore um, ways to integrate gender and nutrition into agriculture extension services. Traditionally, agriculture extension tends to focus on men, what men need and want, on um, focusing on men's schedules and so forth. So we're going to try to learn best practices for focusing on women's needs and what women want. And also at the same time, we're going to explore ways to integrate nutrition into extension services, and this may primarily be nutrition education or um, social behavior change activities, or it may be um, supporting technologies that reduce uh, the burden on women, for example, so they can care for their children more. So we're going to explore the three uh, gender empowerment pathways in particular to do this, and that will include um, women's time, women's labor, and women's control over income. And I also know I've got some co-conspirators in the audience, so uh, please feel free to chime in and clarify what I'm saying now. Um, we will end up having a total of eight Feed the Future countries that will support, and that will be, uh, they will be selected in two rounds. We're really close to the first round of selections, but we can't make the official announcement just yet. The next round will be in another year and a half or so. Um, the way that missions can apply for this is we send out a survey link and they fill that out and then we also look at landscape analyses and so forth and find out where we feel we can have the biggest impact. And each country context will determine the final set of activities that take place. And I think that about covers it. There's also a new Ingenious website which we'll send around and you can learn more. Um, great. So I am going to turn it back over to Richard. I think we have some additional time for a question and answers if there's any additional questions, um, both on the content of the webinar but also on the projects that we have available. And I, I know that we've mentioned this. We are going to send out a survey to everybody that registered as a participant or listening in and didn't register if you're sitting at a friend's computer. I'm sure if you um, either register now or get in touch with KDAD, they will make sure that you get the survey. Um, we still have to develop the survey, so it'll probably be a year or so before we send it out. Um, but we will send this out um, and provide the opportunity to provide additional feedback on the Two page or three page guidance that we sent out, and please, we really do appreciate your assistance. And do get in touch with either Diane, Jeannie, or myself if you have questions about the project that we mentioned. So, Richard, great, and thank you very much. And and, and again, just to give uh, re repeat, up, and that is we're really trying to make the whole concept of nutrition sensitive. agriculture ideally can be measured and that will improve the nutrition um, impact of these programs. So that's what we're striving for. We're not trying to, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, say that these are the only things that are important. These are just some ideas where we, that we feel kind of a minimum uh, for, uh, for our programs um, and, uh, and we re what we want to do is we want to uh, to make this concept work for us to uh, uh, and at the same time to take some very good horticulture, livestock, aquaculture, and legume programs and make them stronger by including um, uh, these critical actions and be able to be a little clearer uh, when we report on how much of this we're going to do. And we need to have a research and evaluation component 
to see if this is really working because the thing, as I said, that struck us is that the Cochrane analyses of the uh, um, of the gardening program showed very little impact on nutrition, and that's something that we want to change. So we really appreciate all of the comments we've gotten and your participation in the the follow-on survey, and we we will get back to people as well. We are going to have another webinar on. Um, in uh, uh, probably in uh, in January about um, data driven uh, nutrition um, uh, programs uh, and um, uh, we're still developing that and we will come back to this topic at that time. But our intention is try to move this thing forward in the next three or four months and see where we uh, end up because this is a crit the whole idea of nutrition sensor programming is going to be where we make uh, progress on stunting reduction in particular. And we're going to try whatever we can do uh, uh, to move this forward. So thank you very much to everybody who participated. Thank you, Richard, Sally, and Diane. And I'd like to send out a special thank you to Catherine Denison for answering some questions in the chat box. And uh, John Nicholson with the Spring Project, who's been sharing a lot of great relevant resources uh, in the chat box that I would highly recommend that everyone use it to learn more about new sensitive ag. Uh, we have about five minutes left. Is it worth uh, bringing up a couple of additional questions that have come through? Um, one of the uh, central questions that a couple of people have asked is about um, about fruit, about uh, local foods, and about wild foods, uh, and how those will be addressed. Uh, do they play any role in nutrition-sensitive in interventions, or are they kind of off the radar? So I think that um, the absolutely that. Um, however, I think that we need to keep in mind that we're talking about value chains here and that wild foods probably are not going to become part of a broad-based value chain. That being said, that does not mean that they don't play an important part of the diet and that they shouldn't play a role in some of the behavior change messaging. Let me, add, let me just add something about uh, indigenous vegetables, vegetables which, is which is a very, very important which are a very important new area, uh, and a lot of them are quite nutritious. Um, uh, and so we're very, very open to this. But the whole idea, you know, let, let's try to, uh, you know, all things being equal, you know, promote uh, for for marketing or value chain or income or consumption the more nutri nutrient rich foods uh, um, as opposed to the ones that may not be. So we're this is not meant to be restricting, but it certainly you know makes sense to us to keep that in mind as we choose the um, uh, the products to promote. Great, thank you. And I'd like to mention to everyone on the webinar uh, that if you join us today, we will send you a, a post-event email that has to the recording of this event and also the uh, downloadable presentation slides in, in PDF form. Those will also be posted on agrilinks.org. Mm -hmm. And we've had um, some great link resources sharing in the chat box. Um, I think, Diane, you answered a lot of questions along the way about concerns about gender, about how, you know, whether we're relying too much on uh, women to take control of nutrition, what role men will be playing in any of this mm -hmm. along the way. Um, I don't know if you have any kind of final comments to allay everyone's concerns about whether we'll really be integrating gender. Right, right. Well, well, one thing one thing I really did forget to mention is this won't just be a project oriented to women. It will also look at men to help support the nutritional needs of their families. Um, and yes, it will definitely. Um, the, the primary purpose of this award originally was to integrate gender, and we decided to add nutrition after. So I would say it still has a tremendous amount of focus in it. And we also know that we can't really adequately address 
nutrition and agriculture unless we address um, gender at the same time. And that is mainly by empowering women or empowering men to help in the nutrition of their families. So I hope that's a good answer for everybody. And I'm happy to follow up with um, individual emails also after. So. No, just the email address for people. Great. Thank you, Diane. And just for the few people who asked about the timeline for providing comments, how, how urgent are these comments requested? Next, uh, what, next month? Uh, yeah, I would say that we'll, the, just with the timing with the holidays, we'll be um, soliciting input and sending something out by the midweek for the survey. And uh, we'll be looking at these after the new year. Uh, just hold for just about five seconds. Thank you. Okay, so I was just saying that we'll probably be looking at addressing the uh, comments and doing incorporation right at the right after or right around. The Perfect. That sounds great. Well, we are running up on our time today, um, so I'd like to thank everyone for joining, and we'll be looking yeah. thanks to our presenters. Our presenters. Um, really appreciate all the posted in the chat box, and we'll be reading them much more thoroughly now that we have the chance to sit down with the transcript. We will contact you soon. And uh, we really appreciate your adherence and your, your buy-in to the concept of nutrition-sensitive agriculture. And um, we will be in touch. And very lastly, if you are interested in joining uh, another AgriLinks webinar this Wednesday, December 17th, we have our Ag Center Council Seminar um, focusing on climate change, land use, and climate-smart agriculture. So we hope to see you again on Wednesday. And thank you very much for your participation. We'll talk to you soon.